Well, Cedar Street Baptist Church, once again, I love you so very much. It's a joy of my heart to be with you. I've been looking forward to this morning all week long. No other place I'd rather be, no other people I'd rather be with. And if you are here uh, for the first time, or again, it's been a little while since you've been here, and people have been kind of coming in coming out for so many different reasons, uh, let me catch you up real quick. We're in a sermon series right now entitled, The Hope of Heaven. The hope of heaven. And we've been looking at the doctrine of heaven. What does the Bible teach about eternal life? What's it going to be like? All right, for the first couple of weeks, we've talked about what the present heaven is like. For those that have died and gone on to be with the Lord, what are they experiencing right now? And then on Easter Sunday, we talked about eternal resurrection, what it will be like at the second coming of Jesus. Last week, we talked about our first moments of true eternal life. We said last week in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, that Jesus invites us to eat from the tree of life. And that tree will be life-giving and life-sustaining and life-enhancing. And when we eat from the fruit of that tree, we will be solidified in that state of glory forever. Well, today we're now in the eighth message of the series. Now we're going to kind of get down and dirty. and We're going to be talking about the new heavens and the new earth. What's this place going to be like when it's fully renovated and fully glorified after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? And as we get started, I want to start with an eternal truth that I believe is true of everybody in this room. The day you were born... God wrote three words on your heart, and I'll prove it to you. And those three words are, happily ever after. And you've been seeking after the fulfillment of those three words since you were in diapers. All right, think about your life and the journey of seeking after those three words, happily ever after. All right, if you started with Disney movies, I don't care what plot it is. I don't care who the characters are. I know how every story is going to end. Happily ever after. All right, maybe we grow up beyond Disney movies and then we look towards our wedding. And we say, there's our spouse waiting for us at the end of the aisle. And when I say I do, happily ever after. In fact, we even have the drive away, right? The drive away, the husband and wife newly married in the car with the words just married on the back and everybody waving as they drive away. What are we doing? We're setting the scene of them driving off into the happily ever after. But of course, we know that as wonderful as marriage is, you eventually make a U-turn in that car and go to work. So then we say, you know what? The happily ever after is when the family that I've dreamed of, I finally have. I have my 2.5 children or I have my dream home with my white picket fence and it's fully paid off or it's the career. I haven't, I'm doing what I love, but I'm not at the right place yet. I get a new boss where I have more freedom and I can do what I want to do. That's when I'll have happily ever after. Then we get into our late 40s and early 50s and we realize, you know what, all right, I'm not going to get happily ever after in my job. No, happily ever after is when I retire from my job. And so we do retirement planning and we say, all right, cross the finish line, celebration of retirement, happily ever after. And then if God is good to us and we live deep into our 70s, 80s, 90s and beyond, we say, you know what, I'm starting to wonder about this happily ever after. I didn't get it after I stopped watching the Disney movies. I didn't get it in my marriage. I didn't get it with my family. I didn't get it with my home. I didn't get it with my job. And I haven't gotten it in retirement. Where's it coming? Is it real? Oh, it's real. That yearning that you have, guess who put it there? God. And guess who's going to fulfill it? God. God is going to fulfill this in an amazing way because as we read the Bible, we see happily ever after is not just a fairy tale from Walt Disney. It is divinely inspired in God's holy word. Now, an atheist or an agnostic would say, well, that proves the Bible is not the word of God. It was written by men because men desire happily ever after. Uh uh-uh. uh. We as Christians say the exact opposite. It proves that it's the word of God because it's God who gave us that desire to seek after happily ever after. Because when we seek after that, guess who we seek after? Him. 
God wrote happily ever after on your heart. And if you read the Bible all the way to its conclusion at the end of Revelation, that's exactly what we see because happily ever after is heaven on earth. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to be looking today at Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 2. The title of our message here this morning is The Hope of Eternal Heaven on Earth. The hope of eternal heaven on earth. And starting today for the next few weeks, we're going to look at just one chapter. We're going to look at Revelation 21, and we're going to go word by word. We're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to see that God has promised happily ever after. So that leads us to our big idea in one sentence. Our hope of eternal heaven on earth will finally become our reality when God's sovereign plan is fulfilled. Our hope of eternal heaven on earth will finally become our reality when God's sovereign plan is fulfilled. So, if you want to know about that happily ever after that God has promised us, true heaven on true earth, would you join me by turning to the book of Revelation? It's the last book in your Bible. We'll be in the second to last chapter of your Bible. So turn all the way. If you don't have a Bible, grab the pew Bible in front of you or beside you. We'll be on page 1233 in your pew Bible. And if you would stand at this time, out of the reverence of the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and fully sufficient word, we're in Revelation 21, reading verses 1 through 2. Hear God's word to us through his servant, the Apostle John. Verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We just thank you and praise you for this day, and we just plead for your power and your presence at this hour. Lord, I I just pray today that it would be an ever-flowing stream of hope that comes out of this message. Lord, I know as we're talking about the glories of eternity, it just seems so far away that it almost does seem like a fairy tale, but it's not fiction. It is divinely inspired truth that you have written happily ever after on our hearts, and we're one day closer to it. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, we'll taste it. So Lord, I just pray that you would be with us and help us to just find great hope and joy that this message would just be a refreshment to the soul for every true believer in this room that the best is yet to come. And for those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be a wake-up call to repent of our sins and place our faith in Christ that we too would come to know the hope of eternal heaven on earth. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week we jumped into Revelation. We started in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, and now we're in Revelation 21. I said last week a very, very concise summary of Revelation, okay? It's a single Revelation. There's no S on there. It's not Revelations. It's Revelation. It's one single Revelation that Jesus Christ is giving to us through the Apostle John who is receiving this information from an angel of God while John is deserted on the island of Patmos. All right, so Jesus is speaking to us through John, and John is receiving this message through an angel, and all this is divinely inspired truth that John is receiving through a vision as he's frantically writing down through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and explaining to us the glory of these end-time events. And yes... Revelation is wonderful, and yes, it is very mysterious. It has baffled scholars since it was written. There's enough truth in there to give us hope and joy. There's enough mystery in there to keep us humble, okay? And while we're on that note, what I want to say as we look at Revelation 21, we're going to be looking at the transformation from present reality to eternal reality. What I want to say is, I'm going to focus on the things we can all agree with, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time or really any time on the things that we can't agree on. Here's what I mean. So there's one concept in Revelation that perhaps you've heard of before, and this concept 
is where scholars can't agree. It's called the millennial reign of Jesus. All right, the Bible says that Jesus and believers will reign for a thousand years. Okay, the millennial reign. Now, there's many different views, but there's two prominent views. And I just want to spend one minute and move on because I don't want to get down in the ditch on this. All right, the traditional Southern Baptist view in the last 40 to 50 years is that that word millennial means literal thousand years. So what most Southern Baptists have believed since the 1940s is when Jesus comes back in the flesh, we as believers will rise and get new bodies and we'll sit on a throne with him and we'll rule the earth for a thousand years before there will finally be end times destruction, final judgment, and then we'll get a brand new earth. But there's another view that scholars hold that, that that word millennial is symbolic. It's not a literal thousand years, but it symbolizes the church age that we're in right now. All right, that right now the kingdom of God is expanding because the church is being built and it's growing and Jesus himself said the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And they believe that when Jesus comes back, all the end time events will happen at one time. All right, the dead in Christ will rise. Those who are alive at the coming of Christ will be changed. We'll get caught up with Christ in the air. He'll come down to the earth. Everybody will be judged. New heavens, new earth. It will be one dramatic, glorious moment. All right, scholars can't agree. So whether you believe that the, there's going to be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth or if you believe that's metaphorical and when Jesus comes back, everything changes in a moment, whatever you believe, what we're talking about today is what everybody can agree on because what we're going to talk about today is after the millennial reign of Christ for what it's going to be like after that for all of eternity. So the purpose of this series is not to get on the, in the ditch on things that we don't agree with but it's to focus on the one thing we can all agree on. So starting today and for the rest of the series, this is eternal realities after the millennial reign of Christ, whether that's metaphorical or that's a literal thousand years, I'll let you come to your own convictions. All right, now that we've got that settled, I wanna look at how we can truly have heaven on earth according to the word of God, that happily ever after that God wrote on your heart, are we really gonna have it? And what's it going to be like with a new body incapable of sin, death, disease, fatigue on a new earth that never is deteriorated or compromised by evil whatsoever? What's it going to be like? Well, let's take a look at these first two verses. Number one, I want us to look and see how we will have heaven on earth when everything old is finally made new. When everything old is finally made new. Verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, this idea of a new heaven and a new earth, it's all over the Bible. All right, the book of Isaiah talks about it a lot. There are other passages throughout the scriptures that talk about a day when the heaven up there and the earth down here will collide and be one new perfect universe. And here's the deal about the Bible. I'm just telling you, this is one of many reasons that you can trust that this whole book was written by God and human beings could not come up with something like this. The first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and the last three chapters of the Bible, Revelation 20, 21, and 22, fit together so perfectly as one perfect story of God. If you've never seen this, I hope this excites you a little bit, because I remember the first time I saw this, I was like, that book has to be from God. Now, I'm going to give you just a taste, because I want to move pretty quickly here. All right, Genesis 1.1 talks about creation. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Revelation 21.1 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth fit together. All right, Genesis 1.3 talks about created light, and God said, let there be light. Revelation 22.5 says, there's no need of light, lamp, or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. Fit together perfect. All right, what about the threat of death and the elimination of death? In Genesis 2.17, God said, when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Revelation 21.4 says, there is no more death. Fits together perfect. What about the threat of Satan and the elimination of Satan? In Genesis 3.1, it talked about the serpent was more crafty than all the other beasts of the field the Lord God had made. 
Revelation 20.10 says the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. What about redemption promised and redemption fulfilled? Genesis 3.15 said that there would be a seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent Satan. Revelation 21.6, Jesus says, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then how about the beginning and the end of pain? In Genesis 3.16, it says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Every woman in this room would say amen. Revelation 21.4 says, there will be no more mourning or pain. What about the curse? The curse is given and the curse is removed. Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground because of you. Revelation 22.3, no longer will there be any curse. Last one I'll give you. God's presence removed and God's presence restored. Genesis 3.23, the Lord God sent him from the garden. Revelation 21.3 that we'll look at next week. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Isn't that crazy? First three chapters of the Bible, last three chapters of the Bible fit together perfectly. Now, why do I bring that up as one story of God? Because when you think of the new heavens and new earth, I don't want you to be thinking about a universe that you cannot imagine I want you to be thinking about a universe that you are living in now that is perfected, that is perfected. In fact, I've quoted him very often here. Randy Alcorn says the prefix re, R-E, that is used in all these words in the Bible tell us that we'll get a new universe, but it won't be new in origin. It'll be new in its quality. All right, the words say reconcile, redeem, restore, recover, return, renew, regenerate, resurrect. Each of these biblical words begins with the re prefix, suggesting a return to an original condition that was ruined or lost. Redemption means to buy back what was formerly owned. So when you think about a new heavens and new earth, don't say, well, Bo, I, I mean, I just can't even imagine it. No, God wants you to have the hope through imagining it. It's going to be like the present earth made perfect, it will be physical and spiritual. All right, you will work and play. You will have family and friends. No, you will not have marriage. We'll talk about that a little bit later. There are some things that will be different, but it will not be an existence that you can't picture, but it will be an existence made perfect. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. It's actually going to be better than it was in the beginning before sin in the Garden of Eden for two reasons. First, the presence of evil is removed. And second, the possibility of rebellion is removed. So in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, we would say it was perfect and it was a place of paradise. But the new heavens and new earth that will eventually take place is going to be even better than Eden because there was still the presence of evil in Eden. How do I know? There was a serpent named Satan who was in the garden, but he is not going to have access to this new universe. And the second is, even though Adam and Eve were born innocent, they sinned. We will not have the possibility of sinning. You have to get this. On the new heavens and new earth, when you're glorified and you partake of the tree of life and you're solidified in that glory, you're not all of a sudden one day going to commit a sin and get kicked out of the new heavens and new earth. God is going to give you a new nature that is incapable of sinning. For the rest of eternity, you will never have a sinful thought, a sinful word, a sinful action, or a sinful attitude for all of eternity. And that is heaven on earth. That is heaven on earth. It is the old made new. So I want you to dream with me for a minute. What aspect of current living that's old is God going to make new? I gave you just a few things to think about based on my own study of a lot of scholars and every word of scripture that I can find on what it's going to be like. Well, let me start with one. Time will be made new. Time will be made new. We will not be losing time, but we'll be eternally gaining time. And we won't feel rushed by time when we don't have enough to do what we want to do, and we'll never again be bored by time when we're waiting for something else to take place. I mean, current earth is one or the other. Sometimes, for me, most of the time, I feel rushed. Sometimes, 
I have friends that always feel rushed and others that are bored out of their minds waiting for the next great event to take place. Time, when it's restored in the new heavens and new earth, will be living in the present moment for all of eternity. You will have all the time that you want to be able to spend with family and friends and to create new things. There will not be boredom and there will not be pressure to fit into that eight to five confines that we've had since the Industrial Revolution. All that will be redeemed. Worship will be made new, all right? We will all have a single heart and a single mind as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing boring about it. Everything we see will be glorious and the natural outpouring of that glory will be to celebrate and celebrate for all of eternity. And here's the thing I love about worship. We're gonna have a whole sermon on this. But there will be diversity and unity together as one. That's kind of hard to do in the church right now. You know, every Sunday when we worship together and we sing, there's always some songs where I hear more people singing than others. Because there's quite a few in here that love the old stuff. Well, there's some in here that love the new stuff. We're born in different generations. We have different tastes, different convictions. Well, in the new heavens and new earth, God's not gonna erase our diversity, but our diversity and unity will come together around the throne of God in a way that transcends human understanding. That's the old made new. Also, pleasure will be made new. There will be a continual experience of pleasure, but it won't be self-centered. It will be God glorifying and unifying us to other people. Also, work will be made new. Yes, you will work for all of eternity. And I, some of you are saying, oh, please no. <laughs> but it's nothing like you're experiencing right now. Here, you gotta get this. God's a creator. And he created you in his image. And you have a, you're hardwired to create. The reason that we don't like work is we're under the curse. The Bible says that we work by the sweat of the brow. All right, we have restrictions that are put on us. and We have energy levels that are depleted. Not so on the new heavens and new earth. You will be free to create. You know, yesterday morning I got up at 7.30. Correct that. My daughter got up at 7.30. And I opened the door, and she's laying in bed, and before I could get the words out of my mouth, good morning, boo-boo, she looked at me, she said, Daddy, let's build a city. And I'm thinking, baby, let Daddy get coffee. <laughs> it's hardwired in us to build, to create, to draw, to write, to sing, to play. God's a creator, and he made us creators. But we're creating under the curse. When the curse is lifted in energy levels, will be infinite. What we're going to create is going to be a joy. It's going to be a joy. Recreation will be made new. Beautiful lakes and rivers and mountains and beaches without the pollution of sin to enjoy nature but not worship nature. To look at nature and allow it to allow us to worship God. And then of course relationships will be made new. There will be intimacy with no cliques. Cultures but one family. Laughter with no crude humor. Communication without any misunderstanding and love without any ulterior motives. Can't wait for that. The old made new. Now there's one key note at the end of verse one, perhaps you read it and thought, man, I hope that's not true. All right, it says at the end of verse one, and the sea was no more. And all the beach lovers in this room said, no, sir. Well, let me encourage you. I think there's strong evidence that when John is saying no more sea, he's not talking about no more seashore, he's talking about no more struggle. Because the sea represented struggle and separation to a believer in the first century. First and foremost, John's writing this on an island where he has been deserted. So he's looking to his left and to his right, and guess what he sees? Water that has caused separation and pain. Think of the disciples in the boat, their lives on the line through all these stormy seas. When they looked at water in the first century, they looked at pain, separation, and struggle. So when John is saying no more sea, he's not talking no more Tybee Island. He's talking no more struggle, no more separation, no more storms. The last storm will take place and the new heavens and new earth will make sure there's no storms again. So that's number one. We'll have heaven on earth when everything old is finally made new. Number two, we'll finally have heaven on earth when everything above is finally below. 
First part of verse 2 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The new Jerusalem. All right, right now the new Jerusalem is the holy city in the present heaven. So if you have family members or friends that have died and gone on to be with the Lord by grace through faith in Christ, they know a lot more than we do about the new Jerusalem. They are walking on streets of gold. They are experiencing ever-flowing rivers. They are experiencing what the Bible says is the epicenter of the presence of God. But the Bible promises that what is up there is going to come down here, and the new Jerusalem will be the capital city on the new earth. Now, scholars can't seem to agree, and we'll find out when we get there. Some believe that the new Jerusalem will be the entire new heavens and new earth. Others believe it'll just be the capital city of an entire new universe. But even if it's just the capital city, I want to paint a picture for you on how big it is going to be and how glorious it's going to be. All right, so further on in Scripture, uh, a little further in Revelation 21 in verses 9 through 27, and then the first part of Revelation 22, the first five verses, we see dimensions and descriptions of the new Jerusalem. Now, let me boil this down. Uh, There's a lot of different words and terms for measurement. Basically, it says that the heavenly city measures approximately 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. All right? It's one huge, massive cube. All right? Now, what does that look like practically, square footage-wise? All my contractors in here are saying, okay, tell me the square footage, Bobo. Well, according to scholar Ron Rhodes, here's what he says. The eternal city is so huge that it would measure approximately the distance from Canada to Mexico and from the Atlantic Ocean to the Rockies. That is a surface area of 2.25 million square miles. By comparison, London is only 621 square miles. Put another way, the ground level area of the New Jerusalem will be 15,000 times that of London. The city is tall enough from that, that from the Earth's surface, it would reach about 120th of the way to the moon. If the city has stories, with each story being 12 feet high, the city would be 600,000 stories high. This is a big old city. Now, we said a couple of weeks ago out of John 14 that God has prepared a place and in our Father's house there are many mansions or many rooms. Well, all God has to have is a high-rise apartment building and we moving on up. You know why? 600,000 stories would make a lot of rooms. Now, here's the problem. Here's what we can't know for sure until we get there. There is so much symbolism in the book of Revelation, it's hard for us to know when we read it what is symbolic and what is literal. All right, so there is a possibility that when we see the new heavens and new earth, it may not literally be a cube, but it may, those may have been symbolic descriptions that God gave to John to give to us to see how majestic and wonderful it is. Now, I want to talk about a couple of symbols really fast, and I want to move quickly here, but here's how the New Jerusalem is symbolic of how amazing it will be when we have heaven on earth. First of all, the cubic shape, that 1,500 by 1,500 by 1,500, all right, in the Old Testament, God handed down directions to Moses on how to build the tabernacle, and the inner sanctuary of that tabernacle, we call it the Holy of Holies, guess how it was built? A cube. And that cube was supposed to represent one thing, the presence of God. So I don't know exactly for sure if those symbols in Revelation are literal, but what I do know is that that cube is supposed to represent that when you are in the New Jerusalem, you are in the presence of God. The second symbol is the 12 foundation stones and the 12 breastplate stones of the high priest represent the atonement of sin. In the Old Testament, all right, the high priest would wear a breastplate and go into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people, and he wore these 12 precious stones on the plate. Well, in the book of Revelation, it says that there will be foundation stones, and guess what? There's 12 of them. Well, that proves that it's going to be a place of purity where all sin is atoned for. 
All right, it also says there's 12 gates and 12 foundations. And it says that in Revelation 21, verses 12 through 14, that the 12 tribes of Israel are on the gates and the 12 apostles are on the 12 foundations. What does that mean? That the people of God in the Old Testament and the people of God in the New Testament are together as one family. And then finally, the rare elements. The question I always get, Bo, is it literally gonna be streets of gold? Well, maybe and maybe not. All right, it says in, the, in the, the New Jerusalem, there's gonna be rare jewels and transparent gold, a flowing river and fruitful trees. These are precious and fruitful and clear and transparent because they represent purity and beauty and provision and perfection. So Cedar Street, we'll finally get an answer when we're gathered around the throne together. I can't tell you for sure that every single symbol in here is gonna be literal, But here's what I can tell you about the new heavens and new earth. When the new Jerusalem comes down, it will be majestic, it will be vibrant, it will be intimate, it will be perfect in every way. It will be happily ever after. So, I wanna give you one final reason why we can have heaven on earth. All right, when everything old is finally made new, when everything above is finally below, third and finally, we will have heaven on earth when everything prepared is finally presented. All right, there's the preparation for the party. And and then there's the moment the, the music is turned on and the party is finally started. All right, the second part of verse two says that the new Jerusalem is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, in the Bible, there's a lot of talk about the symbol of marriage pointing towards our eternity, all right? Heaven on earth is described as an eternal marriage in several ways. First of all, there's the union of God's spiritual world up there and our physical world down here, all right? When heaven up there meets earth down here, there's the marriage of two worlds, but there's the marriage of the spiritual and the physical. Here's what I mean. If you have a loved one that has died and they're in heaven right now with God, as wonderful as it is, they're anticipating a new body because to be human is to be spiritual and physical. And we had a a disunion of that, a separation of that upon our death because of sin. Well, when the new heavens and new earth collide and the heaven up there comes down here, it will be the collision of God's spiritual world and our physical world and we will be completely and totally physical and completely and totally spiritual for all of eternity and it will be like a perfect marriage, never to be separated again. But not only the spirit and the physical, but also Christ and his church. Right now, Christ is not together with his entire church. We talked about that on Easter morning. How many loved ones who love Jesus are with him up there while we're left down here? Well, upon past the second coming of Jesus and then in the new heavens and new earth, there will be a union of all Christians from all time as the bride of Christ with Christ as our bridegroom. In fact, it talks about earthly marriage as the preparation for this. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27 say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any th- such thing, that he might be, she might be holy and without blemish. The Bible says the whole purpose for marriage is to point to Christ and his church. When you go to a wedding and you see that beautiful woman in white, guess who that is? That's us. That's the church. And and the bridegroom that's waiting at the altar, that's Christ. And we've been made pure. We get to wear white because of what Jesus did for us. We receive that purity by grace through faith. And we will be married to Jesus forever so the arrival of heaven on earth is a wedding day it's a celebration in fact the book of revelation chapter 19 verses 6 through 8 call it the marriage supper of the lamb 
It says, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We as the church are covered in white because we're covered in the blood, and we're walking down the aisle. And when the new heavens and new earth collide, that is the moment that we will be eternally married to Christ with our new bodies on a new earth forever. Yes, Jesus Christ is your happily ever after. So that leads me to our, big, to our summing it up. Let me wrap all this together. And I want, you to sh- I want to show you how Jesus Christ is the answer to everything you've ever looked for, looking for that happily ever after. In one sentence, our hope of eternal heaven on earth is found only in Jesus, the one true bridge between heaven and earth. The hope of eternal heaven on earth is found only in Jesus, the one true bridge between heaven and earth. Now, how is Jesus the bridge? I want you to listen closely. If you have any family or friends that say that Jesus is just one of many ways to God, this right there is the death blow to their argument. There's three reasons that Jesus is our bridge. First, Jesus is the bridge between spirit and physical. The Bible says God is spirit. So how can we have a relationship with a God who is spirit? Well, the God who is spirit became flesh. And he wrapped himself in flesh and blood and became one of us. So he's fully God and he's fully man as the bridge between God and man. He's the God man. He's the bridge that unites us together. Also, he's the bridge between heaven and earth. He's the only one that has a foot in both universes. He existed eternally in heaven. He also came down here to live on earth. He ascended to heaven to send down his spirit to live through us, and he's coming back to earth to make all things new. So Jesus has a foot in both universes. He's the bridge between heaven and earth. And again, he's the bridge between divine and human. None of us are God. All right, and out of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, the only person of the Trinity that's also man is Jesus. So I always look at it this way. The reason that Jesus is the bridge that unites us to God is because he's the only one who's God looking down at man and man looking up to God so that he took the hand of God and the hand of man and reunited them together and the place that will be joined together and live together forever is the new heavens and the new earth. So yes, because of Jesus and Jesus alone, you will have happily ever after and you will have heaven on earth. He's the way, the truth, and the life and no man gets to the Father but by Him. That's the promise of Holy Scripture. So as we draw to a close, you know, as I've been preparing this whole series, I've just said, Lord, help me to teach it and preach it in such a way that people would taste it and see that it's not millions and millions of years away. It's closer than you think. Adrian Rogers used to say that we ought to pretend that Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and He's coming back this afternoon. Now, that may be easier said than done, but I just pray that God would put a sense of urgency in your heart that either he's coming back here or you're going up there really soon. And the best is yet to come. And there's no pain that he is not gonna fully restore. There is no tear that he's not gonna wipe away. This is not a fairy tale. The fairy tale that you grew up with watching Disney movies, and I got nothing wrong with Walt Disney. There's plenty of Disney representation in my house. There's nothing wrong with that. But that fairy tale is a bestseller because the storyline comes from God. It comes from His Word. The Bible teaches that we had creation and perfection and then fall, all right, and then separation but promise, and then one day restoration and renewal. All right, so everything old will be made new. Everything up will come down. Everything prepared will be presented and you'll have happily ever after. Now again, I don't know exactly what it's gonna be like, but I know that it will transcend understanding. All right, it hasn't fully entered into our mind or heart what God has prepared for those who love him. But the word tells us, yes, Cedar Street, you can have happily ever after 
when we do have heaven on earth. Let that be your hope this week. Nothing that the earth has taken away from you, God will not restore tenfold in the kingdom if you simply will give your lives to Christ.